suppose only the path here. Well, we get, a sec we get an energy times an energy, so joule squared times second. Joules. But time is integrated. But well, we're integrating with time, though, so that's where the seconds come from. But after the integration, the seconds disappear. No, you can still have time there. But it's integrated all. Let's postpone this discussion to the actual class, and then we can come to the blackboard and find the ultimate truth. <laughs> more more um, uh, other, other questions to the speaker. If more questions one, more questions two, more questions three. Let's thank Aaron once again. And the next presentation will be by Dian Mikhailov, who will tell us um, another aspect. So Aaron was showing what happens if the surrounding of the electronic system is in the thermal state, right? Dian will show what will happen if the surrounding uh, is the pulsed lasers, same as we did for free induction decay and the yeah. photon echo, but he will tell more, <laughs> more of the <coughs> how to expand this approach to a more general situation. Now our most concern is how to expand this. Hey, hey, hit the one that does all, the whole screen. That one. Just no, that that's one. over. No, that's the wrong one. That's corner to corner. That was no. Next one. This one? That one. No. No. You can run PowerPoint and then... Just take PowerPoint. Um, view. Ah, oh, presentation. Full screen. Where is presentation? This is your presentation. Thing. Oh, full screen mode. That one. Uh, okay, so I recently had a kid. So, I mean... And I had a presentation at APS, so I, I thought both my kid and my presentation were beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember this is a part of a, com a three, three panel comic that I read once, but I couldn't find it, but I found this. The only difference is people never tell me that my kid is not beautiful, but people will tell me, but we will rip on my PowerPoint slides. Like, this doesn't, I mean, you probably. Big group meetings where Svetlana is present. So. Oh, oh yes. PowerPoint slides don't make any sense. <laughs> Anyways, hundreds of recordings. <laughs> 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 I mean, I appreciate every input on my presentations, positive or negative. The difference is you never hear, "Oh, that kid is ugly." You know, I never heard that, but maybe it's true. Anyways. Um, so I, um, uh, I'm going to try and make a connection between what we did in class and what, uh, uh, is being done, um, uh, in, uh, uh, uh spe spectroscopy measurements, uh, when people use double-sided Feynman diagrams. So in class we had, uh, uh, the, uh, what's called the, what we call the block equation, uh, which is for a two-level system. Um, but this is not oh. block equation. This is just this basic matrix. This L Louisville equation. This is this is Louisville equation. I've also heard it called block equation no, for no, the two-level system where you have a rabbi frequency. No, no. Here. If you change the variables to projections of quasi-spin. Like S X S Y S Z. Oh, oh, okay. I was okay. That clears. Um, anyways, so uh, when we go to molecules, when you have many states uh, and you have time dependence of your perturbation, then it is uh, very difficult to construct this uh, what's called Louisville super operator. So uh, uh, one can. Uh, uh, benefit from perturbatively expanding uh, the density matrix. So uh, ex straight up expansion of the density matrix, well, first, to, before we try to perturbatively expand, uh, expand it, we just try uh, straight up expansion. 
Um, so this is like integration of the Louisville von Neumann equation, uh, where on the right hand side you have the time derivative of rho, and on the on the left hand side you have the time derivative of density. On the right hand side you have the commutator between the Hamiltonian and the density. But when you integrate over at different times, you get an equation like this, right? But this is not practical, and it also in many cases it diverges. Uh, and even if it doesn't, it converges very slowly, so it's very expensive. Um, so what one, before one goes to perturbation theory, uh, one needs uh, the interaction picture. Uh, so how is, what is the interaction picture? Well, first let's uh, remind ourselves of the Schrodinger picture, uh, where one has a time-dependent wave function and the, imp uh, the operators are time independent. Uh, and to compute the expectation value of an operator, you just uh, take the, uh, the uh, inner product of the uh, wave functions times the operator. So to get the wave functions as a function of time, one solves the Schrodinger equation. In the Heisenberg picture, uh, you start out with your wave function at time equals t0, and uh, you're not worried about how the, time, the wave function evolves in time. Um, what you're worried about is, again, uh, observables, which is expectation value of operators. So what you do is you solve the Heisenberg equation of motion, and you obtain the time dependence of your operators, and um, you, again, you solve for expectation value of your uh, uh, observables in terms of the stationary wave function in your time-dependent uh, uh, operator. Uh, so the interaction picture was kind of invented uh, in order to deal with uh, perturbations. So you have uh, your uh, state, uh, time-dependent state, time-dependent wave function that evolves according to your full Hamiltonian. Uh, but you're interested in the time evolution of some other wave function called interaction picture wave function. Um, and, uh, uh, and you're interested in time evolution according to uh, the time evolution of uh, the unperturbed Hamiltonian. So this wave function is kind of a measure of the difference between the full Hamiltonian, which includes the free and the interaction, and the free Hamilton. So this uh, uh, is a very useful quantity because it's known, the unperturbed Hamiltonian, and uh, this is the time evolution. U0 is the time evolution uh, according to the unperturbed Hamiltonian. So in, in any operator, uh, uh, any perturbation, time-dependent perturbation, can be expressed in terms of the interaction picture perturbation. Uh, once you, this uh, interaction picture uh, operator, uh, time evolution operator is introduced. So with this, you can uh, expand the density matrix in terms of the interaction picture Hamiltonian. Uh, there is the perturbation in the interaction picture, which is known uh, your initial density matrix and your uh, u naught, which are also known because you know h naught. So, so this is is now this is now at least doable. Um, so this is this is the uh, perturbative expansion of the density matrix. And um, this works, but uh, now let's see exactly how it's implemented. So, for example, this perturbative expansion of the density matrix is used to compute polarization. One of the uh, one of the uh, observables that is most conveniently computed this way. So, polarization uh, can be um, expanded in orders of the susceptibility. And when you take only the first one, we have linear optics. So the electric field depends linearly, the polarization depends linearly on the electric field. 
This one is usually omitted for several reasons, not only because of that one. Of, this is one of the reasons why the second order is omitted. There are other ones out there. I'm afraid to make any claims. But uh, the third order uh, the, of the susceptibility is usually the lowest, the lowest nonlinear term that's taken into account. Uh, so, uh, in order to compute the polar, in order to compute nonlinear polarization, you you got you gotta take you got you gotta take uh, um, you you gotta take the expansion of the polarization to third order. In order to compute it with uh, this uh, uh, perturbative expansion. Uh, how is this related to density matrix that we just saw uh, on the previous slide? Well, the any observable is uh, uh, can be computed from the trace of the density matrix. Any observable that depends on statistical ensemble can be computed with dense matrix, uh, which wave functions can't give you statistical ensemble, but density matrix can. So the, por uh, the polarization is the trace of this dipole operator um, times the density matrix. So uh, plug this plug this in, one gets an expression for the uh, polarization in terms of the time-dependent electric field. And this dipole operator that only depends on intermediate times. Um, and when you make the a substitution from Heisenberg, from Schrodinger, from interaction back to Schrodinger picture, these, these time uh, evolution operators that we saw on this slide, they, they disappear because now here you, uh, now here you get a, a U dagger times U, which is one, and here you get U dagger not time times U, which is also one. So one is uh, left with evaluating uh, something like this, or, or this, this uh, inner product. So for uh, the, to the third order regime, one has commutator mu naught, rho t naught, and then mu naught with whatever this is, and then mu t1 plus t, t2 plus t1 with whatever this is. So you have t a product of three commutators, which is two times two times two, which is eight terms. So I went through the pain of typing them all up. And you can see that mu uh, t t3 plus t2 plus t1, which is the latest, mu doesn't really come into effect because it's not inside the commutators. But in, in here, we have all eight possibilities of uh, expanding this, the, the, these brackets that we end up from the commutators. So what you do is you number the terms and uh, to keep track of the terms, uh, uh, Feynman, a long time ago, developed his diagrammatic technique uh, where you, you draw uh, a line of your, that represents your uh, system that flows in time. And at every time you have a perturbation, uh, you have, um, uh, a vertex uh, after which you have some new momentum before which you have the initial momentum and your final momentum is your initial minus the momentum of uh, your perturbation. So you have momentum conservation. Um, so uh, there, are, there are many rules of how Feynman diagrams are constructed, but they, what they do is they help you keep track of all these terms that you get. So, for example, before you go and calculate all these terms, you can draw your Feynman diagrams and see which ones are relevant. And um, so, for example, uh, diagrams like uh, uh, this one uh, will give no contribution because uh, a pulse has to leave the system. So, you can think of this as... Uh, uh, sending a pulse into the system, waiting a little bit, pulse comes out. Sending a pulse into the system, waiting a little bit, and pulse comes out. Um, so, uh, also diagrams where, for example, three pulses leave um, and two pulses come in will also give 
uh, zero contributions. Uh, so um, this is uh, relevant in uh, pump pro spectroscopy, uh, where you uh, send a short. Uh, Another important thing to mention here is that these pulses have to be so short that their times don't overlap. Um, and then um, you can do things like uh, time ordering and rotating wave, which are big approximations that significantly simplify the number of terms involved. Um, yeah. Photon echo and pump, 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 pump. Photon echo is what's uh, uh, is a phenomenon that can be calculated with this technique, and that's what's uh, uh, that's the phenomenon that's uh, prevalent in uh, experiments like pump pro spectroscopy, as far as I understand. Okay, and thank you, dear. Maybe someone has questions to you. So for those little squiggly arrows, like, the, like what does it represent that, like the directionality? Oh, like if uh, it's going right or left. Uh, if it's going, if it's going right, uh, it's the sign of the electromagnetic wave. So you have e to the power of negative i k x plus omega t. If it's going one way, you have e to the uh, plus i k x minus omega t. If it's going, if it's going the other way. So it's like different phases. Uh, so it's it's different. Well, I well. No, the phase is. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure about, I'm not sure how the phase will come in here, but um, it, it just the propagation, e to the, e to the ikx plus omega t tells you which way the wave is traveling, if it's going left or right. And the way they do experiments is they only look at a certain direction, like the transverse direction in the material, for example. Or uh, so you can only have a wave coming in or a wave coming out. Um, so you have to very. What they do is they very um, carefully set up their experiments so that you can only, you can only look at two directions of the wave, mm -hmm. as, as far as I understand. Yeah. But, and you, the, you only work with a certain polarization. I think you only work with circularly polarized light. So you can. Is that kind of like convention or is that just? Uh, um, you have to ask an experimentalist who does pump probe spectroscopy what they do in order to simplify what they're looking at. Uh -huh. And please help on this question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's discuss it later. It's a serious question. It is a serious question. But the, uh, mathematically speaking, yes, if it goes right, it's e to the negative i k x plus omega t plus i omega t. If it's going left, it's e to the minus. If it's e to the minus plus. Space. Yes, the sign of the electromagnetic wave. That's what I read in the book that's authority on this. More questions How to, it's implemented to, uh, this. Dan? What's the down and up mean on the vertical lines? The down and up <laughs> on the vertical lines is uh, my fault in taking out these arrows. It, uh, um, the arrows on, on, on these lines don't mean anything. They Both of these lines propagate in time. So both of these lines, uh, these lines you can think of as a, the prop as the propagator uh, um, but, but, uh, but you hope, yeah. and you will correct me if I will be wrong. Okay. So um, 
we all agree with wave function that can evolve in time. And this line is wave function going forward in time. Forward, forward, forward. Minus infinity plus infinity time. But now for observables, we need not only wave function, but wave function conjugate. And we propagate them together in form of density matrix. Instead of bra and cat, we have cat and bra. So we both cat and bra. So conjugate of wave function is the second line, which is propagated also in the same direction, but it is wave function with star conjugate. And then we have the same time slices. So at this time, pulse comes in, but it affects only the cat, cat and doesn't affect bra. Then we wait, like some other diagram, like here, wait, at this point, uh, pulse affects bra. And if one takes all this process into account, then one gets realistic observables. Yeah? Any objections? No, that's perfectly valid that's from a mathematical standpoint. I was trying to physically explain what, what, the, what the lines actually mean. It's propagation of density matrix, if you want to think of it that way. It's, it's kind of abstract. Doesn't, in, in single-sided Feynman diagrams, these mean actual particle propagating through the system. But here is like the statistical average okay. of, of, of a... Satisfied? Um, question that maybe as a homework, draw a diagram for photon echo. But now we do not have time. Just make a piece of paper with diagram for photon echo. OK, let's thank uh, Diane once again. And the next presenter is uh, Brennan Gifford. So he will open our eyes broader. He will show that all techniques that Dan has introduced are applicable not only to photons, but also for radio frequency pulses. So um, he will look more on the physical implementation and uh, analysis of the processes, but it will be same nature of multi-pulse experiment, bringing, uh, creating coherences and then letting them to relax and connecting it to a real world and observables. Floor is yours. Okay. Okay, so we talked about NMR a couple of times thus far, and I think we, uh, when I, I guess when I talked about it, I put it in the context of continuous wave experiments. So there we're thinking about a, a nucleus, right? It's got spin and it's wobbling. And when that wall, or so then, then you shine that sample with an external electromagnetic field. And when the, electroma the external electromagnetic field's frequency matches that wobble, you see resonance. And if you can determine those frequencies, then you can determine something about that wobble, which will tell about the local environment of the electrons. I'm sorry, of the, of the nucleus. Um, so, uh, so instead of doing continu or instead of doing continuous wave experiments, though, in reality, they're doing um, FID experiments, which are free vector decay. So in, this or so in this method, you're getting the same data, but what you're doing is you're first taking your sample and you're making it all resonate, right? So all of the nuclei in the sample are made resonate at once by shooting it with an electromagnetic pulse, a uh, very, very short electromagnetic pulse. And then that short <coughs> electromagnetic pulse um, makes them all resonate. And then you can watch it over time and determine uh, the times at which they kind of the, the, they uh, resonate back, if you will, and then that'll tell you some, or then that'll tell you some uh, some information about the local environment of the electrons by telling you the the uh, the energy or the how do you say the frequencies with which these these wobbles occur. Um, and so this is in reality how they do it uh, because you can do it very quickly. And so even though the noise signal to noise ratio in this method is more, uh, they can do, because it's quick, they can do lots and lots and lots of uh, runs and then average them. Um, OK, so just to show a little bit about the instrumentation. So they have the magnetic, which we talk, or the magnet, which we talked about before, and your sample. And so the important thing here that I guess I want to get across is, so you have the receiver, which is getting the, uh, which is showing or which is telling us when they are giving a signal as to when they resonate back over time right because then then they're outputting energy but that but then you also have um the 
the input, so the or the, the input electromagnetic frequency. And so they actually mix these two. And then by reading that profile that they get, which I'll show you in a minute, then that's uh, where they can do their Fourier transform and determine the waves that are coming out here uh, from, from the receiver. Um, okay, so actually I'll talk about that first. Okay, so here's some real life uh, signals. So um, as I just mentioned, you're gonna see this decay over time, right? Because uh, you actually uh, made all of the sample resonate, but then also you're going to add in the, um, the, the, the RF frequency uh, that is incoming. And so by reading the distance between these waves, how we can determine uh, the, the amount of time with which they relax. And so if this complex, um, I guess complex waveform, a sum of waves, uh, we can see that like in this example where it's going, um, or the, the, the broader wave, which corresponds to the one second signal, and then the, the finer wave, which corresponds to the 10 hertz signal, I'm sorry, one hertz and 10 hertz signals. And so again, if you do a Fourier transform of this, you can deconstruct which waves existed in the original sample. And so in order to actually invoke this experiment, then we're going to be take, making a 90 degree pulse, which means you're taking all of the spins, you take them from there to this plane. And so now they went from the Z to the XY plane. And so now, they're, now you can imagine this vector, this wobbling, or not wobbling, but turning around in the plane. And so they're a little bit offset because as we mentioned, their local environments are slightly different. And so uh, then the, so then after uh, a brief time, so what we'll do then is we'll give another pulse. And so that's a 180 degree pulse. So then now will flip it back to the opposite side of this plane. And then we are able to see when they come back together because uh, then we get a spin echo generated at that point. And so then, um, so that will tell us, or so then we're getting, so we're actually doing multiple pulses and you get the signal after the second pulse, right? Then you're actually reading the echo off of that signal. And so if we imagine it in the two, in, in the 2D plane, which I just described, um, so we have the X and the Y. So if the singlet, and meaning that there's just one signal um, in, in, in the mixture, then you would have, um, then you just have one peak, right? But if you have, say, two signals that are in the mixture, and again, they're, they're at different, slightly different angles, they're going to be dependent on each other. So you would then be able to, uh, I guess, read the degree to which they lie in the X and Y plane at one point, or correlate the signal to that. And so the signal looks like this, um, different effort. And so for correlated electrons, then you get signals that look like this, where they both go, where they can go up and down, and then you have inner, or, and then um, then that tells you the degree which they're lying in the XY plane uh, when they resonate. And so then triples and quartets look like this. So I guess the important thing here is that by reading this, they can determine if you have two individual singlets, which means two signals from non-coupled nuclei, or you have uh, signals from coupled nuclei. Um, in that then you, then, you, then you get this more complex signal. And so, as I mentioned, they're reading it after the second pulse. And so by reading the second pulse late, oh, I should mention, so these different profiles then too are over time. So at time equals zero, everything's up, right? But then as time goes on, you get a slightly different signal. And in the case of the non-coupled um, systems, that's not true. But in the case where they're coupled, then you get the signal where it's down. We get we're reading over time as we go from this to this to this to this, et cetera. And so if we were to uh, change the time that we read after the pulse or after the second pulse, then we can get multiple of these profiles um, where each one looks slightly different. So the normal spectrum again would be this say time um, would be here, like this what you call time equals zero. In other words, read at the echo point. So you do the second pulse and then read when, when you see the echo. And then if you start to read later than that, you get this signal and then read a little later. Again, you're, you're changing the time after which you read. And then if we want, we can take these spectra and we lay them onto, um, onto two dimensions. So but just by shifting each of these. And then so by getting, so by both doing a normal NMR experiment but by delaying the time between the first and second, or between the second pulse and the read, we can get some information as to 
which, uh, which signals are coupled to which signals. So for example, uh, in this case, of course, all the diagonal signals are coupled because they are themselves. And then, but then uh, the off-diagonal signals, you'll get a, a point at which, um, or a point for coupled signals, for example, this signal and that signal uh, are coupled, meaning that in, in, in a chemical sample, those nuclei are close together.